to recap from last time. So we said our CFD, these are our CFD learning objectives. Eventually, we want to be able to run simulations. We want to do some computer simulations. And as we saw, saw in the last lecture, we said that uh, these computer simulations could probably help us with, uh, let's say, reducing experiments, right? I think some of you had come into the lab today and started playing around a little bit with ANSYS Fluent. And I think uh, that is something that uh, a lot of you were like wondering what we are doing in there. You know? So we took an airfoil and we put it into a box and we said, okay, I didn't explain to you in the lab why we are putting in these box, what's happening in there and so on. But uh, that's kind of what we are going to fill in in the next couple of lectures. Okay? So our learning objective today is to let's say, develop approximate numerical methods. So in the last uh, part of the course, you looked at uh, finite element method. And uh, in the next year, you'll be looking at finite volume method. And today, we'll be talking about something called finite difference method. Right? So these are different methods of, to achieve some particular objective. And as we go through lectures two and three, We'll try to see how, to, how these uh, numerical methods are different, how they are similar, and how you can use it to solve a flow problem. And uh, lastly, in lecture four, we'll also try to implement it with like a MATLAB code and uh, see how it works and how it compares with regard to your, uh, let's say, ANSYS Fluent and other commercial softwares. Okay? So just, just to give you a brief recap from the class, because uh, uh, we want to re remind ourselves of what we had done and uh, where this lecture kind of pits into the, all the nice pictures and videos of CFD that we saw last time, right? Okay. So if you remember right, so we started out thinking about uh, applying the modeling and simulation mindset. We said uh, we have a steel pipe in uh, which the outer surface of the steel pipe is at a different temperature. The inner, in, inside the steel pipe there's a fluid flowing in and that has a particular different temperature. And our goal was to understand what are the different physics that are there involved in this problem. So we said probably there's definitely fluid flow. There's a fluid flowing in there, so definitely fluid flow. There, there are different temperatures, which means there must be some kind of a heat transfer, right? There's two different temperatures. Probably the solid could be expanding or contracting, so there's some solid mechanics. Depending on the thickness of the pipe, it could be vibrating, so there's vibration and dynamics in there. So, Lots of courses that you already studied kind of goes into it. And then we said, what's the most important thing that we want to do here? Right? So our most important thing was to look at heat transfer to look at what's the temperature of the fluid that is coming out. Right? So the whole idea here was to look at what are the different physics involved in a problem like this, and how can I simplify that? And maybe like simplification like 2D geometry, simplifications like using a, let's say, a symmetric boundary condition, or looking at what is the most important physics in all of these. Right? I can't do a simulation of all of these. I want to only want to focus on the most prominent ones. And what are these most prominent physics? Right? So if you remember right, we talked about things like uh, Reynolds number. I just want to recap from what we had done last time. A very important non-dimensional number is a Reynolds number. And then we primarily defined uh, three different equations. In there. We said there's an equation for mass conservation. There's an equation for momentum conservation and for energy conservation. Right? So we said, and uh, then we looked at uh, different scenarios, and we said, OK, what are the different terms in these uh, momentum conservation? We did not focus a lot on the mass and the energy itself. We said when we are looking at compressible flows, in the next year, we'll look more into the energy conservation itself. But we are more focused on the incompressible laminar flows in this year. And we said we'll look at uh, what are the different terms in our Navier Stokes or conservation of momentum equation. So there's a gravity term, viscous term, pressure gradient, convective term, local acceleration. We took different examples, right? For example, here is an example of uh, incompressible flow. Similarly, we took different examples in there. What, what would happen if there's a viscous flow, right? So we said each of these different terms could go into zero. For example, it's a, if it's a viscous flow like a hot chocolate or a lava flowing, then we could say that local accelerations were zero. We took in various of these scenarios uh, last class to look at how we can simplify this complicated 3D equation into a more simpler form that we could solve for, right? We can, if we had like all the computing resources in the world, we can solve this probably. But then uh, we don't want to do that. We, we have specific problems of interest to us. And we want to solve that particular problem. So we want to make approximations. For example, in incompressible flow around a car, we said, OK, maybe the density is not changing. Density is constant, right? So we looked at different equations. And uh, our whole goal today is to take this complicated looking set of equations, which is not very nice to look at. 
and see how to make it into simple things that we understand, like addition, multiplication, and subtraction. Right? If I have two numbers, a, let's say one and three, I can add one plus three is four, or like I can do three minus one is two. I want to reduce, but then this calculus is something that I don't really understand. I want to take this hard partial differential equations and convert it to something that I can easily work with. Like, you know, I know addition, subtraction, and multiplication. I want to convert it into that form, right? So that's our entire goal today. And uh, in the meantime, we also looked at, like, you know, what's the different uh, uh, meshes that are there, how do you judge a good quality of a mesh, and so on, right? So well, let's just, let's just uh, shift gears a little bit. And let's keep this equation in the background, right? I'll just change to a, uh, my iPad to write, but then let's keep this equation in the background because we want to eventually try to get rid of all of these derivatives. So we have this dou a, dou by dou x, dou by dou y, dou by dou z, you know, all these things that are spatially changing and temporally changing, right? So like I said, like, so we, want to, we don't want to do this complicated stuff. We want to make life simple for us. So let's try to just uh, change a little bit. Let's try to see what, how we can simplify our lives, right? Okay. Any ideas so far about how we can change our partial differential equations into a more simpler form? Okay, so that's, that's, that's the entire, go entire goal of the class today. So let's, let's think about it. So let's say, what, what do we have here? So we have equations that say, uh, okay, let me change the color. We have something like dou by dou x. Or let's say, let's make, it, make our life more simpler, and we can say d by dx. We have terms of a d by dy, d by dz, okay? And we also have some kind of term that relates to d by dt. And then we have the variables we have, let's say, u, v, w, and p, okay? okay. So, let's, with this, let's say, our premise to start with, we have some derivatives and we have some variables. So what are these variables? Let's say, sorry, these are our velocities and this is our pressure, right? So these are our derivatives in space. And our derivative in time. So if we go back to look at our equation that we have here, this is what we have. So we have some d by dx, d by dy, d by dz, and some d by dt, right? So there's something varying in time, something varying in space. So what, so what are these quantities that are varying our velocities? So last time we talked about this quite a bit. So for example, uh, we talked about the difference between solid mechanics and fluid mechanics, right? So we said if it's a solid object, it has a reference shape. Doesn't matter whether I keep it in my hand or keep it on the table, it has the same reference shape. Right? I don't want to break my iPad pencil, so maybe I'll take this one. And if, if I apply some load on this or some kind of a deformation, it has a shape change. Right? So I can always take this original undeformed shape and map it and say that with the regard to respect to this shape, this is the new shape. Right? I can always write a displacement. But with regard to our fluid, we can't do that. It does not, we don't have a reference shape to start with. If you put it in a bottle, it was the shape of bottle. When I dropped it on the floor, you know, it, it just spread around, right? So if you, when, it, when it's dropping, it's taking a spherical shape like a, like a bubble. So it doesn't have a reference shape to talk with, so we talk about the velocity of a fluid particle. So let's say any particle in this fluid, this is the velocity with which it is traveling. And we want to be careful here when we say velocity, because we have velocity in the x, y, and z direction. So we have the vector. So if you see this in the x direction, velocity in the y direction, and velocity in the z direction. Okay, so there are three important things that we want to think about. We can't, we are like just in the previous uh, half of the class, you talked about displacement. Displacement in x direction, y direction, and z direction. Here we are going to think about more in terms of velocities in the x, in the x y, and z directions. Okay, so since there is a velocity in a particular direction, it's probably also changing. It's not constant all the time. Maybe it's constant in some cases, but maybe it's also changing. So there's some d by dx. So you know, along the x direction, let's say my velocity, u, v, and w are changing in a certain way, or something along the z direction and something in the y direction. Similarly, with time, you might not have a constant flow. It's also changing with time, right? So these are what our derivatives are representing. What are these representing? They are representing some change. Okay. Okay. 
So we, we, we know what derivatives mean. You already studied in high school. I don't want to go back into it. But then we just want to just recap things just to understand in a very, very fundamental way. OK? So now, we have some complicated equations that we said. But we don't know how to solve these complicated partial differential equations. So let's say we have a partial differential equation. Let's say PDE. Right? So what do I know? I know, I know addition. I know subtraction. I know multiplication. Right? Or if I have, like, let's say, two numbers, let's say, one and, let's say, a number a and b, I can do a plus b, I can do a minus b, or I can do a into b. Right? Or if I have arrays of numbers, right? A vector, let's say, I write it as, let's say, let's say, a1, a2, a3, b1, b2, b3. Let me call this as vector a and vector b. I can then add up two vectors. I can say a plus b. I can do a minus b. I can do a dot b or a cross b. Right? That's something I can do. Right? I'm still basically taking numbers and adding them or subtracting them, multiplying them. So something our computer can easily do. Or if I have, for example, let's say matrices, let's say let's call a matrix A, let's say A11, A12, A21, A22, similarly a matrix B, let's say B11, B12, B21, B22. I can do A plus B, I can do A minus B, I can do A into B. Right? Again, there are some constraints if I can do this or not, the sizes have to match and blah, 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 right? But technically, I can do this, a computer can do this, right? But what we don't know is how to solve this partial differential equation that we have. So we want to convert something that we don't know into a form that we are more familiar with, right? So if, if, I, if I have a partial differential equation, I don't know how to solve it. If I can convert into a matrix equation, I know how to solve that. In, in your linear algebra class, probably you use gauss seidel method or Gaussian elimination to solve this matrix equation. For example, if you have an equation of the form, let's say, a into x equal to b, right? This is something that you are familiar to solve with. You know how to solve this. But if I give you an equation that says, let's say, dou u by dou x plus dou v by dou y plus dou w by dou z equal to 0, this probably you don't know how to solve this, right? Or probably with some time you will probably learn how to solve this. So we want to convert our partial differential equation into a matrix form, right? So this is our partial differential equation, and this is our matrix equation. So whether you are using a finite element method, a finite difference method, finite volume method, you are essentially in some essence at the bottom line converting your partial differential equation, which you don't know how to solve, into a matrix form that we can solve, right? OK, so let's, let's, say, let's keep this in mind for now. And let's uh, keep it at the back of our mind that eventually we want to end up with a matrix equation, OK? So OK, let's go back to our car problem here. Let's think we have a car. I'm not, I don't draw very good, but then let me try to draw a car here. So essentially, let's say I have a car. Let's say, OK? Now I want to simulate the flow around the car. For example, today, some of you probably did an airfoil. And uh, one of the examples that you'll work in the lab is also to look at a flow around the car. That's right. right? So we want to solve a flow, flow around the car. As you know, when you're driving on a highway, you're driving at maybe 70, or probably some might drive at a higher speed. And then you probably might, uh, you might have felt there's a lot of wind coming in, right? So you want to look at the aerodynamics of the car, make it really nice so that you don't feel any vibrations. You don't, uh, you know, you have a very smooth ride, right? So we want to look at the improved aerodynamics of a car. Probably one of the areas where you probably have looked at it is mostly in Formula One, right? So on a straight stretch, you're going at almost 300 kilometers per hour, which is really sufficient enough for it to take off. Right? But then you don't want the Formula 1 car to fly, you want it to be on the ground, so you need some kind of sufficient downforce. You know, you're manipulating the aerodynamics so that it doesn't take off, but it stays on the ground. But you don't want to push it too much to the ground because then there's going to be friction. Right? You, want to, you want to play around with it. You want to understand the flow around this car in a way. Right? So what are we going to do? We are going to put this inside a box. Let's say. Okay? So this is our object of interest.
and let's say this is my domain. If you are, for those who have been in the lab today, you probably already tried doing this. You put an airfoil into a box. And they didn't tell you in the lab as to why you are putting the airfoil into a box. They said, you need to put an airfoil there, you need to put a box around that. Right? We didn't uh, talk about why you want to put it into a box. Now, we want to probably, let's say, have some kind of an inlet. Okay? So let's say we have some kind of an outlet. So outlet. And inlet. Uh, we can probably assume that we have an atmosphere here. We'll not talk about the boundary conditions now itself, but in the next lecture we'll go a little deeper into it. Now we want to solve this problem. So as the car is moving, there's some uh, wind that is flowing in which is acting on the car, so there's some kind of, uh, let's say, flow around the car. You, know, you probably have seen some of these really nice pictures on the internet, right? And there's uh, some kind of a flow happening around the car. Now, this is what we want to simulate. So what are we going to do? We talked about a lot of mesh last time. So we said we want mesh, we want mesh. Now, there's a good mesh, there's a bad mesh. And I kept harping about the mesh for half an hour and saying that how important meshing is in CFD, right? So, so what are we going to do? We are going to create some, what we call as a mesh. So let's say we take our box again. We put a car in there. And we are going to, let's say, do some meshing. Okay? This is not a very good mesh, but uh, just for our purposes to start with, something to think about. Okay? But then now if you saw, my mesh doesn't go inside the car, right? So there's a car. Right? So just so that uh, people know that there's a car. Okay? So my mesh is around the car. Right? So we want to, because the object of interest is not how the air is flowing inside the car, but how the air is flowing outside the car. Right? So we want to look at the airflow around the car. Another example that we probably looked at in the lab, for those who will be coming on Tuesday and Friday we'll also be looking at, is probably, let's say we had a, let's say a blood vessel, or crudely to think of a pipe, inside which there's some kind of a blood flowing. So here, if I'm going to mesh it, I'm going to mesh it inside the blood vessel, or inside the... Because my fluid is flowing inside, it's an internal flow. I don't care what's happening outside the blood vessel. Of course, there's probably people who will care about it, but for my purposes of looking at how the blood flows in this artery, I'm looking at how the blood flows inside the blood vessel. So I'm going to discretize our mesh inside the blood vessel. Okay? So now, we said that we have discretized it, so we have kind of made some kind of a mesh. So what, what is the important thing here to think about? So let's go back and so let's, let's remove the car for a moment and let's see, think of that we want to look at a flow without the car for example and then we'll put our car in there. Let's say we have a mesh. Okay. So now we have some points. In your finite element you call them as nodes and you call these as elements, right? If you go back to your finite element, you said this would be a, like a mesh, and then a mesh has some nodes and it has some elements. Right? So what are we going to do? We want to convert somehow our partial differential equation into our matrix form. Let's say, let's kind of think back what we want to do. We want to try to achieve that goal. We had this complicated partial differential equation, and eventually we we want to somehow get this into a, like some kind of a matrix form, right? So we said we want to convert everything into this kind of a matrix equation. You know. Right. And so, okay, so let's go back. So let's think of the simple mesh that we have and uh, look at what's happening. If you look at it, if you remember your finite element, at each of these nodal points, you had your unknowns. Right. So you said that, okay, let's have unknown that said my, my displacements and velocities, or displacements in finite element. Here we are going to call it our velocities and pressure. So I'm going, going to just write as u bar, which is like a vector, or I can probably rewrite this as, let's say, u bar and p, let me write as a u, v, w, and p, right? So let's, uh, or for example, here we are thinking of, let's say, 2D, for example, then I can probably eliminate my w, and just say I have u, v, and pressure. So I have three unknowns in there. One is the velocity in the x direction, one is the velocity in the y direction, 
and then some kind of a pressure right so at every point i have a i have these three unknowns in there okay now let's try to simplify it even further before we uh, so that we can understand thing let's just take a line yeah for example it could be a very thin rod where you have a heat transfer right so one of one end of the rod might be at different temperature compared to the other and heat is going to transfer across that right again it's some kind of a heat transfer problem now let's try to again divide this into nodes and element then we can just approximate it with a 1d geometry right so now let's think of this easily so let's say the distance between each of these uh, nodal points are delta x okay so that's the distance now we we talked about something called mesh convergence last time we'll come back to what's mesh convergence in this context okay. now at each of these points let's say let's say i have some kind of a velocity in the u direction some pressure in the u direction or it could be there could be temperature as well some unknown some unknowns i don't care what they are for now okay so now let's say i have an equation that i want to solve it and all i have i have some uh, some things like d by dx right let's not worry about the time for now so since we have reduced our three dimensional problem d by dx d by dy d by dz and all of these things into a simple 1d problem now we say 2d and then we reduce it to 1d problem right so we kind of gradually reducing so this is our 2d and we reduce it to 1d so since it's a 1d there's only one thing happening there's only velocity in the x direction Right, and then we will try to build on it, and how to go back to 2D and 3D in a way. Right, so we, in sense we have only one dimension; the only things must be changing only in the x direction. There's no y and z at all, so that we don't care about what's happening there. Right, let's for now we we'll neglect also the time. So the neglect the let's neglect the time. Right, so let's assume everything is constant with time, which means that uh, d by dt. Any, any anything is basically zero, right? So for now, we just want to make our life as easy as possible to start with, and then make it more complicated as we go ahead, right? So our goal is determine we want to determine let's say du by dx. Simple thing to start with. Right. So since we have simplified our equations, we we have this complicated equation. I said there's no y. Anything with y is probably going to zero. Anything with z is going to zero. Anything with time has gone to zero. Right. We are left out with some terms that has some derivative of x. For now, let's assume that we have a du by dx that we want to somehow calculate, and we don't care about everything else. So let's say I call each of these points. Let's say I call this point as i, i plus one. I plus two, I minus one, I minus two, and at each of these points, I have let's say I write U I, P I. Here I have U I plus one, P I plus one, right? U I plus two, P I plus. I don't know my velocity at each at the entire thing, but I know at some certain points. Let's say for now, I, I somehow know that. And I'm going to use this to kind of calculate my derivative. If I'm able to calculate my derivative, then I could probably solve my partial differential equation. Okay. So let's say our goal is to solve this partial differential equation. And our goal, since we have already reduced our partial differential equation to say that we have neglected the y direction, z direction, and the time, we only turn regard to x. How something is changing with respect to x. And now we want to somehow take this. Even simpler partial differential equation and write it in some form of a matrix, right? Eventually, our whole goal is to write everything in terms of a matrix, right? Okay. So, so what's the definition of this derivative? Let's let's go. So, what what does du by dx mean in general? So, let's say if we go back to our mathematical definition, we can say at any point, let's say x, or any point, yeah, any point x, right? So we have a x. At any point x, we can write this as u of x plus delta x minus u of x divided by delta x, and this is again in the limit of delta x tending to zero. Right. So we said in the, this is our mathematical definition that we know from what we have learned in the in our class in in let's say in in our high school and so on with regard to derivative so if we had two points 
around the vicinity of x, if I know another point x plus delta x where I know the value, then I can find the derivative of this particular point in a way. Or in other words, it's something nothing but a slope in a way, right? So we, we could also define this as a slope. So how do we get this? Let's say let's try to go back and try to uh, solve, solve this out in terms of because I know only values at some discrete points i, i plus 1, i minus 1 and so on and I want to somehow bring these two pictures together, okay? So let, let's think of this, let's start to write it out. Let's try to write out, out our Taylor series for example. So let's try to write a Taylor series expansion. So we can say u at any x plus delta x or at any, sorry, yeah, so u at, mm, yeah, at any point x plus delta x, nothing but u at x plus delta x into du of x by dx plus delta x square by 2 factorial into d of d square u of x by dx square plus so on, okay? So plus the a cubic term and so on, right? So I'm just going to limit to writing this up to here. So I can write, that means that if I use this, I can write my du of x by dx is nothing but x plus delta x minus u of x divided by delta x plus some higher order terms. Okay. Now, we just read, read out the same thing, right? So that's how we got, got our derivative. There's some higher order term. We'll not worry about that for now. We'll come back to that in a moment. So now, let's try to write this in, in terms of a graph. Let's try to pictorially try to understand this. So I have a, I have a, let's say I have a curve. This is how my u is varying with regard to x. Okay? So I have some point. So point x, x plus delta x, and x minus delta x. Okay? Or these are my points in some way. These are my point i, i plus 1, and i minus 1. Right? So we, as we saw back in here, we have basically taken our line, or 1D, and divided it into n number of points. And at each of these points, we say we know the particular values of velocities and pressure. And we want to find the derivatives of these things. So, so once, we are, once we know the derivatives, we can solve our partial differential equation. Or we can, we are saying that we can somehow convert our partial differential equation into a matrix form which we can solve. So that is our goal there, right? So, okay. So now we, let's say we have something of this nature. So somehow our u is very along x in a very complicated manner. And we want to find the derivative. So as you know, this, let's say, this is our derivative. Let's say, let's try to use a different color here. So this is my exactly my du by dx. So you already know that you know du by dx is nothing but the slope of at that particular point, right? So we are trying to we don't know all the values, but we know at some i minus one, i plus one, we know at some discrete points, and using this we are trying to approximate this actual value du by dx. Okay. So let's try to see if we can do this. Uh, let's take a different color maybe. Okay, let's see. So now, if I know the i plus 1 point and i value of these two points, maybe I can write my du by dx as this. Oops. Uh, let's see. Okay, let me try to get it as, okay, right? So, I'm approximating my actual slope by an approximate slope here. So what this is nothing but, going back here, let's say, so there's nothing but u at x plus delta x, or let's say, or other words, let's say, let me rewrite it as u at i plus 1 minus u at i divided by delta x. Okay? Or if I just knew the point at i minus 1 and i, I can also rewrite this one as, let's say, I can take the difference between these two points 
and I can rewrite this as this line as u of i minus u of i minus 1 divided by delta x. Okay. So I, I know the values of my actual quantities at certain points and I want to find the derivative at certain points. So why do I need the derivative? If I know the derivative, I can put them into the partial differential equation, I can convert into a matrix form and I can solve for it. Our whole goal is we want to solve that so that we are able to understand how the fluid is changing in, in, in our entire domain. Right? So without solving the partial differential equation, we don't want to solve the partial differential equation, we need to get these derivatives. Right? So let's say, so we, we have two different things that we said at, at this point i, I can approximate it in a way. Right? So one is what we call as a forward, so we can write our du by dx approximately as, so we can write our du by dx approximately as u of i plus 1 minus u i by delta x plus some higher order terms. Or we can also write it as i minus i minus 1 by delta x plus some higher order terms. Right? But what if I just know, I don't know the value at i, but I know the i plus 1 and i minus 1. Then again, I can probably also again use that idea there. Maybe, let's see if blue works here well. Uh, maybe purple. If I know these two values, I can probably connect the line across them. Right? And then that would essentially be nothing but, so this line would essentially be i plus 1 minus i minus 1 by 2 delta x. So again, I can have a third equation here that says I can also write du by dx as i plus 1, i minus 1 by 2 delta x plus some higher order terms. Okay. So I have three different ways of writing my derivative. Right. So now that opens up a question, which is the right way to do it? So there are three different ways. For example, we have three points, i, i plus 1, and i minus 1. Right? So how did we get the i, i plus 1, i minus 1? We had a very complicated problem here. Let's say we had this car inside which we, over which we want to look at how the fluid is flowing. And somehow someone told us that, hey, here's the Navier-Stokes equation. If you solve that, you know, you'll know how the fluid is flowing over this car. Right? So you go solve this Navier-Stokes equation, you'll get it. Okay, then I said, okay, I don't really know how to solve my Navier-Stokes equation. It's a partial differential equation. I'm not that smart. I'll probably convert it to a matrix form. You know, I know how to solve matrix equation. I'm very good at linear algebra. So I'm going to convert it to a matrix form. I know addition, subtraction. That's all I know. That's the limit of my mathematics. Right? So somehow I said that somehow this, uh, somebody told me that if I can approximate my derivatives, it can happen. So I start with something more simpler. I said, okay, well, why don't we take a 2D problem, forget about the car for now. Let's just see how the fluid is flowing or the wind is flowing, for example. I said, okay, 2D is again like too much for me. Let me just think of a line, right? For example, if I had a tube or a pipe in which water was flowing, it's a one-dimensional thing. I can think of the fluid is flowing only in the one direction. Probably I don't care about what's happening in the lateral directions. So I, I probably said, okay, let me, let me even think, make it more simpler. My life is... I don't want to, you know, mess too much up. I don't want to spend too much time. I'll make it into a 1D problem, you know, flow in a pipe. Very, very simple thing. If I can solve this, then maybe let's see I can, if I can do a 2D thing, right? So I said, okay, at some intervals, I put some sensors in there, right, at different points of the pipe, and I'm going to measure what is the velocities. And somehow, some, I'm going to put some magic device, which will also give me what's the pressure at each of these points, right? So it's a very simple problem. You have, you have a pipe in which there's a water going in there. You know, I, I can put the discrete points, I can put sensors, get the velocity and pressure. Now, if I know this, can I get the entire field of how the fluid is flowing? Let's say, can I write my u of x or, and u of x comma t? I also said one step ahead and said, okay, I don't care about time. You know, let's assume that everything is moving in a steady state. Nothing is changing with time. So if I measure at one point of time, it's probably the same thing to infinity. So we said in our partial differential equation, we, we can neglect everything that uh, uh, relates to the, uh, let's say, derivative with regard to time and so on, right? Okay. So we only have one derivative with regard to x, and we have really simplified our Navier Stokes. We want to sort it out using our numerical method. Okay. So that was our goal. So we said, okay, if I can find du by dx, maybe even d square u by dx square, 
Then I'm going to sort out my Navi stocks. I can solve this. So my whole goal and my life is revolving around saying, how can I get du by dx if I have my measurements at certain discrete points, right? So I said I have my point i, i plus 1, i minus 1. i is where I am standing, i plus 1 is this side, i minus 1 is this side. I put three sensors. So now with these measurements, can I get, can I solve my partial differential equation, right? So then we said, okay, let's try to look at some, uh, the meaning of this derivative. We said, okay, if you are a derivative, math mathematically we are talking about a slope on a curve. If it's a straight line, then the slope is zero. For example, if it was a horizontal line, slope is zero. If it's a vertical line, you have infinite slope. So probably it's not that it's some, somehow changing with x. So we want to find this derivative which is changing with x. And we said, okay, if we know three points, then I can write my slope very nearly in three different ways. Right? So one of the ways was basically I said, okay, i plus 1, uh, i minus i minus 1, i plus 1 minus i, or the, the last point minus the first point. Okay? I said, okay, so I have three different ways of writing. So one is the forward, uh, derive, forward difference method, forward derivative, or forward uh, difference. Then I have the backward difference. And then I have what I, what I call as a central difference. Right? Again, if you look back at it, look back at our mathematical definition of what a derivative is, we said du by dx is, let's say, some point x, uh, x plus delta x minus the value at x divided by delta x. But then the important thing was limit of delta x going to zero. Again, if we take our limit of delta x going to zero here, we have somewhat very, very similar idea of what we had discussed there, right? So if as, as the delta x starts to come to zero, if you can see here, let's say, let's say if we, as the points come closer to closer to zero, the, all these three lines probably have a very, very, very similar slope. That's our analogy. So when we are going to look at mesh convergence later on, so what should be this delta x? that we can probably be happy with, right? So that's what you did in your mesh convergence if you're done in your finite element. You'll definitely do in your CFD. As this mesh size delta x becomes smaller and smaller, when can I say that I have approximated my derivative? That's essentially the bottom line question that we want to answer on. Okay. So now, can somebody think of how we can write our second derivatives? I'll give you guys a couple of minutes to think about it here. Just also, probably if you're just a quick break uh, for maybe five minutes, and if somebody wants to stretch a leg or if you want to think about how do we write our second derivative. So I said, if I know du by dx, and probably if I know d square u by dx square, right, I can probably solve my Navier-Stokes equation. That's what I said. So now in one day, one day sense, I've written what my du by dx. If I know three values at three points or values at two points, I can calculate that. So I can do the same thing over, you know, for every point on the line. I can say to take the value at that point, the point behind, or at that point and the point in front of it, or the two point front, front and back points, and calculate it continuously. Right? I can get the derivative over the entire line. So now, can, how can we calculate the second derivative? Right? The question comes down. So we have done the first derivative. We have written the du by dx. Go back, let's, let's uh, kind of keep in mind that we want to solve this flow around a car. We want to increase the complexity, but before we increase the complexity, we want to start small. We're first thinking, okay, let's, uh, let's assume that our car is flowing in a pipe, right? So everything is flowing in one direction. So we have only x, nothing is varying in y and z. Right? Nothing is varying in time. And we said, okay, now we can get du by dx. Then, right? So let's assume it's incompressible flow. For example, if we take my mass equation, let's say the first equation that we have here, you can see that we have an equation that says, let's, say, let's write our mass conservation. We have rho into ux by dou x plus rho into uy by dou y, rho into uz by dou z. Right? So I must do, for example, simple thing, I assume it's incompressible, so my density is not changing. Right? So density is constant. Right? Incompressible. 
Right. So then essentially I can take it out of my derivative. I don't have anything varying in y and z. So then all of these terms are going to zero. Right. So I have rho into dou ux by dou x equal to zero. Or in other words, since density is a constant term, I can say ux by dou x equal to So I know how to solve this thing for now, right? So I have some second derivatives as well that I probably want to think about. So where are my second derivatives, right? For example, let's say, if I take my momentum equation here, right? So if I look at, let's say, let's say that since y and z, everything is going to zero, so lots of other terms goes to zero. For example, let's say, take the equation two, where you have dou, you row into dou x square, right? So for example, we have a term in the equation two that says, Oh, probably we don't need that. Okay. Yeah. Wait, so, so the original function for the Taylor series is f of x plus delta x plus delta x. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's because we wanted to go. So, so we are thinking of f as a function, any functional, right? So f is, for example, here we are thinking of the function as a velocity. So velocity is a function of space, as a function of x. Okay, sorry. Because I'm just, I'm just going off the Taylor series from the layer. Yes. So I did write x plus delta x. Oh, you didn't? Oh, yeah, you didn't. Yeah? No, sorry. Yeah. So it is x plus delta x. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, let, let's think of, for, for now, let's, uh, before we go ahead, let's take a five minute break here and try to think about how to write our second derivative. Right. Just some time for you guys to stretch your legs and also to just give your minds a thought. We know how to write our first derivative. We know two points. We can write it. How do we write our second derivative? Right. So after that, we'll try to see how do we write our derivatives across x and y as well. Okay. So now it's about 13.45. We return back at 13.50. Let me come up. Yeah. yeah probably. Okay. Okay. Let, let's think. Let's see that. So if you have three points, how do we write the derivative? Then? That, that comes out question next. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Okay. Uh-huh. Okay, you think it's, you can, you're thinking in the right direction. Maybe, maybe. What do you think? Maybe you want to write it down and give it a go? Okay. Okay. <laughs> 
Okay, guys. Okay, let's let's get back to place, and uh, let's let's start thinking about it, right? So one of your friends said that we need uh, three points. So the first derivative we could do with two points. The second derivative with we need probably three points. That was that's what somebody said. Uh, how many of you might agree with that? Do you, do you guys agree with it? Okay. Okay. So you're guys still giving us a thought. Okay. Let let's get down to business right let's, let's try to derive this thing so if you're able to derive this thing we can solve our problem and uh, we can go ahead this just for those who forgot what we were doing we want to solve our Navier-Stokes equation we want to let's say optimize the aerodynamics of our car so you're a formula one engineer you want to optimize the aerodynamics of the car right so that you don't want the driver to fly away you want you to win the race so the car dynamics has to be optimized Right, it, it, well, you want it to be nice, so you are asked to solve this Navier-Stokes equation. So you go and tell your boss that, hey, I can solve the Navier-Stokes equation, and I can make the Formula One car go much better than the, our, let's say, rivals. Right. So then you start uh, getting down to business. You say, okay, that's a very complicated equation to solve. There's x, some things are varying in x, y, and z direction. Things are varying in time. Let me start something very simple. Right. So then we said, okay, let's let's try to think of everything in uh, a two-dimensional manner. Let's first put a car in a mesh, and let's see if we can do that. And then we said, okay, okay, let, let me take one step back. Let me try to forget about the car. Let me just try to put something in there without the car. Let me say if I, if I can solve without the car. And then we said, okay, 2D is probably a difficult place to start with. Why don't I start writing as a 1D? Let me think of like, you know, my car is in a pipe, it's moving, moving in a pipe, right? For example, Elon Musk wanted to build this thing, what's that called? So it's something that moves in a tunnel, right? So everything is moving in a one dimension and in a pipe, right? So there's some flow happening, so water is flowing in a pipe or a wind is flowing in a pipe and you want to solve this. Nothing is changing in the lateral directions, so only everything is moving in one direction. And uh, just to make our life more simple, we said, okay, nothing is changing with time, right? So let's, let's start with the most simplest case and then try to build upon a complexity, right? Because it's, it looks already quite dirty and we want to somehow uh, take our partial differential equation, write it in a form that we want to add, subtract, and things, right? And so we said, okay, we have some terms that are dy dx, which is something is varying in x direction, right? 
So the wind is flowing in a particular direction and it's moving in a particular direction at a particular velocity. And then it's changing with time. How fast is it changing with? We said it's not changing with time, but it's changing along this direction. We want to find a derivative. That's our bottom line. Right? So we said we can write a derivative at any point in three different ways. So if I, if I can put a sensor at different points along the pipe, I can find the velocities. If I know the velocities at different points, I can write my derivative. That was what I started out with. And then we said we can write our derivative in three different manners. So if we know two points, I can find a derivative in, in, a, in three different ways called forward, backward, and central difference methods. Okay. So our second goal was to find what, how can we find our second derivative, right? So if I find my second derivative, then I am one step closer to solving the Navier-Stokes equation. So if you look at, if you did not observe, one thing that if you looked at, we have already achieved our goal here in a way, right? So we said our goal was to convert our differential equation into some form of addition, subtraction, and multiplication. On the left side, we have a derivative. On the right side, all you have is an addition or a subtraction and a division, right? That's our entire premise that we started out saying that this will work because left side is a partial differential equation we don't know. I know how to add, subtract, and multiply, and I want to convert into a form that I can add, subtract, and multiply. Right? If you look at the right side, all your, you don't have any derivatives. You have values at certain points which you can add or you know, subtract, and division is essentially nothing but universal multiplication. Right? So if, if we have all these terms written in a certain format as in the right hand side, all we need to do is just add everything. There's no derivative, it's just simple addition and subtraction, right? So let's try to simplify each of our terms in here. If we go back here to our Taylor series, so let me, let me just copy paste that from here. So let me take it from here. Copy, okay. So I'm just being a little bit lazy here. So let's paste it. So we said, this is what we said from our Taylor series. So we already derived our first term. Our term of interest now is our second term here, so second derivative. Okay. So now I can easily write that as well. How can I write that? So that's my point of interest, right? If I can write, let's say if I, let me try to write two points here. I can write i plus one as ui plus delta x into dux by dx plus delta x square by 2 into d square u of x by dx square. Right? Similarly, I can write u minus 1 minus delta x Oh, sorry, yeah, sure. So if I know the value at ui in the i-th point, I, using my Taylor series expansion, I can also always write what is the value at i plus 1 and also at i minus 1. So once I know these two, I can always add them, right? So if I add them, let's say I add, I can write ui plus 1 plus ui minus 1, right? equal to 2ui plus delta x square into d square u of x by dx square, right? Or if I just simplify this, I can get, write my square minus 2ui i minus 1. Yep, yep, getting there. I just manipulated the same thing that we already derived in terms of Taylor series expansion. We used Taylor series expansion last time to get our du by dx. We got a forward difference and a backward difference, and we are just using the same idea here to get the second derivatives as well. Right? I'm not going to derive higher order derivatives. That's something that you can do if you're interested. So finite difference method is still used in a lot of uh, direct numerical simulations where much higher order derivatives are derived. So even though it seems like a a uh, very simple method, it's, it's still extensively used in CFD, right? So it's not that finite difference method is a very simple thing, it's not used. Probably you won't be simulating a car with a finite difference method, 
But uh, you probably there's a lot of other applications with regard to finite difference method being used, especially in direct numerical simulations. Right. So our bottom line is now we are trying to get our first derivative, second derivative. We did in one dimension. Right. So now let can we use the same idea to extend it into two dimensions? Okay. So let's let's try to make our life a little bit more difficult. Let's say let's let's try to extend it into two dimensions here. Let's extend to. Right. So when I say extend to 2D, that means we have an x and y. So let's try to take a mesh again. So let's try to think of a simple mesh here. I'm going to divide a number of boxes along the x direction and a number along y. I'm going to say the distance is delta x and delta y. Okay. So I've taken a 2D domain. We had a 1D domain, right? So initially we had a 1D line. Now we kind of start to make it a little more complicated. And now we say, let's say we look at a 2D problem, right? So something that seems to be of interest to us now. Right? So now we can try to solve, uh, start solving some flow problems that are of some practical importance. Okay, uh, even 1D is not bad, but then okay, let's let's think of we don't think that maybe 1D is useful. Uh, some might think that 1D is not useful. Maybe 2D is a little more useful, right? Okay. So for now, to start with, let's say. Let's say to start with, let's assume that delta y is same as delta x. Let's say. First assumption. Okay. So we want to build a complexity. We started, we said we had a 3D problem, but then we said let's let's think of our 3D problem as a 1D problem. Now our 1D problem where, where we said the distance between the points is delta x. Now we made it a 2D problem. Now we said there's a delta x in x direction and delta y is the distance in y direction. And to start with, we assume that everything is uniform. That means that delta y is same as delta x. Okay. So we take our domain that we have and split it into small things called cells. So we have like nodes and cells, let's say. And what we know as cells, for example. Okay. So let's say let's think of a simple point here. Let's say I initially I denoted each of these points as i because we had a one dimension, right? So along the one uh, x direction, we said the point. Let's say we do denote a point by i. But then along the y direction, let's say we denote the point by j, right? So you have the, for every point, I can say an i comma j index, right? So I can call this point as let's say one comma one. I can call this as two comma one. This as three comma one. I can call this as one comma two, one comma three, and so on, right? So in general, I can call any point as i comma j. So and then I can easily similarly write I can write this as i plus one comma j, i minus one comma j, right? I comma j minus one, i comma j plus one. Okay. Similar and similarly we can also write these ones as well as so this is also like i minus one comma j plus one, this is i minus i plus one comma j plus one, and so on. Right. So I can represent the entire neighborhood, let's say, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Around any, can you see, the, hopefully you can see, probably not. Let's use a different color in there. Maybe this is possible. Yeah. Okay, so around any point I comma J, we have, let's say, three, three to eight points, right? So we have eight points around the neighborhood of any given point i comma j. And if I knew these points now, can I write my derivatives? Now coming back into 2D, in the 1D we have basically had dou by dou x, d by dx. Now in 2D we also had d by dy, right? So for now again, uh, to start with, we also assume that d by dt is zero, right? Okay. For now, let's assume that we, we have nothing changing over time, so everything is in a steady state. So we need to get the derivative with regard to x direction and y direction. So once I'm able to get these derivatives in x direction and y direction, then I should be able to put them back into my Navier stock, solve them, get the flow, and uh, see how the flow is going on, right? So essentially, so we are trying to slowly build up our complexity from 1D now into a 2D. And even in 2D, we are saying the grid is uniform along the x and y direction, okay? So let's take a couple of minutes here just to think about how do I write my 
d by dx and d by dy. So I know my neighborhood at each of these points, let's say, at each of these points i comma j, okay, at each point i comma j, I can write my ui comma j, pi comma j, right? So I'm, I'm uh, or let's say, let's say if you want to think of it in a more simpler way, in your MATLAB thing, you'll call it as i comma j or pi comma j, right? So for those who are more uh, used to the MATLAB notation and uh, use MATLAB, you'll call it as index i comma j, right? So now, if I note every i comma j, how do I write my derivative in x and y? So, so what are my d by dx, d, let's say du by dx, du by dy, and du by, let's say, d square u by dx dy, right? So, let's, so this is what's, what's our mixed derivative, right? So can, can you think of for a moment how we can write these different derivatives? Okay. I'll give you guys a couple of moment to, uh, minutes to think about it, and then we can come back to try to write it down. Nothing has changed much here. We just have two dimensions, right? So since still the idea of lines, you can still use along the x and y direction. Think about how you can write the du by dx, du by dy, and the third mixed derivative. So what's changing here? And what has not changed? Right? Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, for now, let's, let's let, uh, yeah, let, let's not too much worry about that. Let's say, yeah, they're partial derivative, dou square u by dou x square, and let, let, yeah, they're partial derivatives. For now, don't worry too much about that. We'll come back to maybe make it more theoretically rigorous as we go ahead. It's, right. it's becoming partial derivatives. Yeah. The, idea, the idea is you differentiate with respect to one, mm -hmm. holding the other as a constant. Right. Yeah, you're absolutely right, but how do I write this? in a discrete form. So you are talking in terms of the calculus, right? I don't know calculus. I'm not so smart. I only know how to do addition and subtraction, right? So last time we took the du by dx and wrote it in a form that I can add, so you know, 0.1 plus minus 0.2 by delta x. I just did some addition and subtraction in there, right? And multiplication. So can I write this thing in a similar way in a two-dimensional thing, right? Well, I don't really know calculus. I don't want to do calculus, you know. I, I don't like it. I barely pass calculus, so I don't like it, right? So I, I want to do addition and subtraction. So how do I do that? Okay, so let's come back to this. So nothing has changed with regard to your du by dx, right? So for example, if you go back to write our, let's say we think of the forward difference. Nothing has changed here. If we wrote our du by dx as u of i plus 1, minus ui divided by delta x, right? So this was what we wrote originally. The, the idea still holds good, right? So it's still along the, along the x direction, that is still the only thing now, you are representing each of these points, let's say, right? So let me just, comma j, right? So the only thing is that the index is changed, but then the, the idea of the derivative along the x direction still is the same. 
Similarly, you can write your du by dy as u of i comma j plus 1 minus u of i comma j divided by delta 1. Right? Or if we write our backward difference, we can write our du by dx as u of i minus 1 comma j minus u of i comma j by delta x or du by dy minus 1 comma j sorry comma j minus 1 minus u of i comma j oops uh, my mistake here minus and plus minus and plus delta y right the idea still holds good. In respect, the only thing that's changed is now we have two indices to represent each point. Right? So when we were doing a one-dimensional thing, we, each point was represented on a line. If you go back here, where is it? Yeah. Each point had only one index to represent it. So I represented the point. Only thing that's changed in our two dimension is we have two indices to note, uh, let's say, denote every point. Each point is denoted by i and j. So i is, let's say, the distance in x direction, j is the point distance in the y direction to some extent, right? Nothing else has changed. Our idea of the concept of the derivative still remains the same. Doesn't matter whether you are doing in the two dimension or one dimension, the same idea still holds true. Yeah, there's some, some changes that we need to think about, but then the entire bottom line is the same in a way, right? Okay, so now, Let's try to write our second derivative as well, Sim similarly. Similarly, we can write our second derivative, let's say, dou square u by dou x square. I can again write this as u of i plus 1 comma j to u i comma j plus u i minus 1 comma j by delta x square. Right? I'll leave the mixed derivative as a homework for you guys to think about and write it, and then we can come back in the next class to see uh, how we are doing there. Right? But eventually, if you look at it, we are essentially write, writing all our equations, all our partial differential equation, in terms of nothing but uh, simple addition and subtraction here. Right? So what we have done is we have taken our complicated domain that we have, or our problem, split it into smaller, let's say, cells. Each of these cells are denoted by points, endpoints. We are saying that we know the values at these endpoints somehow, magically. Or we at, least, at least if we know the values at these nodal points or endpoints, then we can find out the entire, uh, we can solve for the equation. That's essentially what we are saying. So when would it fail, when would it not work is something that as we go ahead in the next couple of class, we'll try to figure that out. For now, we have taken our 2D problem, said in the x direction, we can divide into cells of uh, sizes of delta x. In the y direction, again, delta y. And if I know, let's say, the value at each of these points, then I can find the derivatives of these. If I know the derivative, then I can solve for the partial differential equation. If I know the partial, I solve for this, then I get a solution of the fluid is flowing. So essentially, that's like what we are trying to do, right? So now, okay. So we've got the first derivative, we've got the second derivative. Let's just try to see if we can, uh, what would happen if you have a non-uniform mesh? Here we assumed that the delta x and delta y are constant. Right? So we are saying that the delta x and delta y is the same everywhere. So next, everywhere we have the same delta x. You see. Right? But then, again, in the y direction, we said delta y is, uh, again, same everywhere. For example, if we go back to our previous problem, let's say if you look at this mesh, that we said, okay, is this a good mesh? We are looking at different types of meshes in the last class. If you look at the mesh density around certain points, for example, if we go on the top of the image, the mesh density is much more coarser. As we come lower, the mesh density is much more finer. Right? 
So we can't have always have uniform mesh that like we were talking about last time, but maybe the mesh will be smaller at certain points near the wall where you want to capture the turbulence and things like that. But as you go away from the walls, then probably it can be coarser. Or for example, if you have two interfaces, like two liquids, like water or air, right? So there you might want to, you know, refine a little more. If you go far field, then you might want to refine less. So uniform grid is not always, let's say, a great thing to have. So we want to make sure, see how, what would happen if there's a non-uniform grid, right? So we are slowly increasing our complexity in here. First thing we said, okay, if delta x is same as delta y, right? But then, that, again, when we wrote our equations, we, we didn't worry too much about that for now. But maybe our mixed derivatives, maybe this becomes important, maybe. Maybe. I don't know, right? So somebody wants to try it out and see. So, or uh, we still wrote it in terms of delta x and delta y, right? So it seems to be still generic. But we assume here that our delta x is the same throughout, delta y is the same throughout the domain, right? So let's try to increase our complexity a little bit by saying that maybe at some places we want to have a better refinement than in some places, right? We don't want to have a very, very fine grid everywhere. We don't have like a big computer to solve a billion, pro billion uh, node problem every time. We want to keep it smaller, right? So delta x and delta y are not uniform, okay? So let's, uh, let's assume, okay, now let's, let's remove the assumption that delta x is not constant, delta y is not constant, right? So still our assumption, we are still saying nothing is changing with time, right? We have not said anything about, uh, we have said delta y is equal to delta x, maybe it's not equal to delta x for now, I don't know that, so let, let me not generalize that. So we have three assumptions to think about, right? And we want to again go back to writing our derivatives. And once we write our derivatives, we can probably solve our problem. That's our bottom line here, right? That we want to solve. Okay. Okay, so let, let's try to, before we go here, let's take a very simple example. Here. Let's try to see, let's, because we have been writing lots of derivatives and things like that, we have not been able to put it into like a Navier-Stokes equation or any kind of equation to see if we really are getting a matrix form or whatever, right? So let's take a very simple example. Let's take what's known as a Laplace equation. Okay, so let's say we have, let's say dou square u by dou x square equal to zero. Very simple equation, no mixed derivatives. We have two second derivatives, one in the x direction and one in the y direction, right? So, has anybody heard of Laplace equation before? Yes, please. Where? I've heard it from in, um, in one of the mathematics modules earlier this year. Okay. So does it have any physical connotations? Is it used in, uh, in any... Do you know where it's used generally in terms of, let's say, the physics of the problem? Any idea? Yeah? Sorry? Okay, electronics. Okay. Okay. Then any other ideas? Okay. So then let's come back to keep that question in mind. So where is Laplace equation used? Yeah. So where is it used? We want to answer this question. Okay, let's keep this question in mind. So there are a couple of uh, uh, answers here. So one said electronics, or mathematics. Okay, so we'll come back to answer that question. So let's put a pin on that and keep it there for now. We want to really solve this Laplace equation. We think that it can be used for a lot of important stuff, but we don't know where it can be used for, but we want to do it yet, okay? So now, how do I write our second derivative? So I've written my second derivative as, let's say I have a domain like this. I've taken my simply, my simply a 2D domain. I assume that delta x and delta y are the same everywhere, okay? And uh, let's try to solve this out. For some point i comma j, let me try to write it out so that we can see how, it, how everything unfolds nicely. So let's say you have dou square u by dou x square, dou square u by dou y square equal to zero. 
So I can write my first derivative as ui plus 1, ui plus ui minus 1 by delta x square plus u, sorry, yeah, probably, probably there's a j as well, sorry, my mistake, ui plus 1 comma j minus 2ui comma j plus ui minus 1 comma j delta x square ui comma j plus 1 i comma j ui comma j minus 1 divided by delta y square equal to 0. Okay. To start with, I said that my delta x and delta y are same. I didn't enforce that then, but then I think maybe yeah, it's a good point to think about for now. right? Just to see how everything unfolds, let me assume that delta x is same as delta y. Okay, Assume delta x equal to delta y. So what do you get? Ui plus 1 comma j plus ui minus 1 comma j ui comma j plus 1 i comma j minus 1 minus 4 ui comma j delta x square equal to 0. Right? So if I know the point, if I know the value at i comma j, and a neighborhood point, so I have i plus 1 comma j, i minus 1 comma j, my 2 on the left and right, j plus 1 and j minus 1, top and bottom, right? I know the four of these points and the value of that particular point, and I know how to solve this equation, right? So can I separate them out in such a way that I can write it in a matrix form? Anybody think of that? So if I can write it in some kind of a matrix form, can I write this as something like, uh, let's say, comma j, i, let's say i plus 1 comma j, i minus 1 comma j, i comma j, u i comma j minus 1 comma j plus 1, equal to. Can I separate it into a form like this? Right? I'm just thinking loudly here. How do I separate this into a form like this? Right. If I have, like, for example, the entire mesh, then maybe I can separate it into a form like this. Right? We don't see the structure yet. Okay. But at least we have come to a point where we have we did not have we don't have any kind of partial derivatives anymore, but we have some kind of addition and subtraction there. We are not completely solve the problem, but we at least can see that, okay, there's some addition, subtraction, multiplication that we are more familiar with than the partial derivatives that we started out with. So what did we start out with? We said we're going to solve this uh, Laplace equation, which is a, uh, which has some physical applications. We, we put a pin in there to kind of go back home and look at where this is used and come back in the next class. So, but we think it can be used in electronics and mathematics, right? We said that, okay, let me try to write this in this discrete form and try to see if I can solve this out, okay? So that's essentially my goal. So I've kind of come to a form that I think only has addition, subtraction, multiplication in a way, but I still don't yet see the matrix form. So for now, let's keep it aside for now, and then we'll come back again in the next class to see how to put it into a matrix form. But at least one thing that we saw here is we have taken a partial differential equation and written it to a form that we can play with in terms of addition and subtraction, right? Okay. So what's the catch here, in a way? So one thing that we saw, we said there's a delta x square, which means the smaller the delta x, right, so it's somehow going to influence this equation in a way, right? So we need to think of uh, how small should delta x be. Right? Or, for example, here we said delta x is same as delta y. How small should delta x and delta y be? So that's an important question to think about. Right? So let's put again a pin into these questions. You know, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, so somebody said this, uh, it's probably related to mesh convergence. Let's say, let's say. It is related to mesh convergence Sorry? It is related to mesh convergence studies. We need to know the, we need to know the maximum amount, we need to know the minimum number of elements or the maximum size of each element okay. that we can have for our, for, for our analysis to be converted to the real thing. Okay. Also, then, are we supposed to do real calculations like this in the coursework, those big ones? I don't know, we'll talk about the coursework next week, but probably yes, probably no. Uh, good question, right? So, like we started, talked last time, mesh convergence is a very, very important thing in CFD. So, if you're not done mesh convergence, then I don't trust your solutions, right? So, probably mesh convergence is important. So, uh, well, somebody said that uh, this delta x is somehow related to mesh convergence. An important thing to think about and ask me next class if I don't come back to it, right? So. Some, I will left out some questions here. So where is Laplace equations used, right? So what is this delta x? How small should delta x be? So why, why, are, why am I leaving these here? Because these are very important questions that we want to answer before the end of the class. And something that you want to look at it before you come back to the next class as well, okay? So, okay, I think we are doing reasonably well on time. So last thing we said, we want to see how, we don't want to have a uniform mesh. Right? So before we went into Laplace equation, we started this thing, but we got us a little bit sidetracked. So let's say we take this back and cut, and let's put it here. Okay? So let's say, oops. Okay. So we go one last uh, step before we finish today. We say what would happen if delta x and delta y are not constant? So it's basically varying across x. Delta y is varying across y, in which case, how do I rewrite my Laplace equation? How do I solve for it, right? For example, there can be some regions where, for regions like we said, if you are solving a flow or a car, somewhere around the boundary of the car, very near to the surface of the car, we want to have a higher mesh density. But somewhere far away from the car, then we want to have a lower mesh density so that we are really able to, uh, let's say, have an optimal mesh, okay? And uh, there were some other terms that were thrown in called mesh convergence. We don't really know what mesh convergence is, but we will probably go and talk about that as we go in the next two classes. But terms to remember, mesh convergence, right? So it's an important term that I said last time. We kept talking about mesh convergence, but we did not say what it is, right? Okay. So let's try to solve it. Uh, let's, let me give you guys a couple of minutes just to think about what would happen if delta, delta x and delta y are not constant, right? So essentially now, my, let, let me put my mesh in there. So what am I looking at? I probably have like my delta x is like different at different points. Hopefully that's a little bit evident in the picture, but maybe, maybe, okay. So maybe my delta y is very, okay. I have a non-uniform mesh somehow. My delta x and delta y are not constant, but they're varying along x and y. I can still represent any point i comma j, oops. I can still represent any point i comma j, right? And I can write all the neighborhood points. Okay, right? So let, let's try to think of what we were trying to do here. Just, just to recap before, we, before I give you a couple of minutes to think about, we started out saying that we want to solve the problem of a car, right? So we started out saying that we want to solve the problem of a flow or a car. But then in the lab, we also said that we want to solve, we also want to try out how, what would happen if a, there's a blood flowing in a blood vessel or water flowing in a pipe. So we said we differentiated one is an external flow, one is an internal flow. We said the most important physics for us is to look at what is a fluid flow. I'm not, I don't care about it, the rest of the things. For example, when there's a flow happening, probably your car is vibrating a little bit. If you have seen in Formula One, the front wing should not deflect by more than a certain amount. So there's like a, like, like a threshold of how much it can deflect. I don't, I don't care about it, right? So there are probably people from structures background who care about it. Probably I'm coming from a fluid thing. I only care about how the fluid is flowing. You know, for me, everything is rigid. I assume that for now that the structure is rigid, it's like you know, standing there like this. Nothing is changing, nothing is moving. So I assume that the flow is flowing over the car, right? So my flow is external, so I'm going to mesh everything outside the car. 
Or for example, if the blood is flowing inside the uh, artery or water is flowing in a pipe, I'm going to mesh inside the pipe. To start with, I said, okay, let's think of the mesh to be very simple. We are going to just divide it into like, you know, like, like, a, like a chessboard. Yeah? Just uh, simply chop it up into even pieces along the X and Y direction. We said started with uh, dividing along the X direction, how to calculate stuff. Then we said, okay, let's move on to see how we can do it if we are doing it in a X and Y direction, two-dimensional thing. So one of the things that you probably want to think about when you do your coursework is to see how you can take your 3D problem that you have and approximate it to 2D problem, right? So you probably your coursework will have a very complicated 3D problem, and if you try to solve it with uh, 3D meshes, you will not be able to do it. Not with the, definitely not with the computer cluster. Even if you have a bigger computer, you're probably your answers fluent or might have a limit on the number of cells. So you might have to intelligently think about how do I reduce my 3D problem into a 2D problem? What are the physics of importance? How do I reduce a 3D problem into a 2D problem? For example, let's say a simple thing, I'll give you an example, is a pipe flow. You can think of it as an axis symmetric problem. Take it along one plane. Right? So it reduces into a 2D problem that you can solve it on your computer or even on the computer cluster. But then, for example, like we, if it's a more complicated problem, how do we think about it? So that's, that's one thing to think about. Right? So 2D is not essentially completely useless. So, so we said, okay, we have a 2D mesh. We divide into, again, a chessboard kind of a very even mesh. And we said that the delta X and the delta Y spacing are all the same in both the directions. And now how do we how do we get our derivatives? So once we know our derivatives, we know how to put them into our Navier-Stokes equation, which basically is going to give the flow around the car or flow around any object. Okay. So we said initially we started saying that x and y directions are same, and now we want to kind of make it a little more complicated, saying that what if x and y the sizes are not the same? Now can I again write, go back to write my equation? So we have an equation that every time we, can, we are making an approximation, we, we have made a lot of approximation to start with, and every time we are removing one assumption after the other and trying to see how our equation is becoming more complicated to solve in a way, right? So we said we took an equation of Laplace equation, we said, okay, we have some equation here, and everything reduced to a nice uh, addition and subtraction. So can we do the same thing here now if a delta x and delta y are not constant, okay? so. Let me give you guys uh, three to five minutes here to think about, and we can then again come back to write our equations. Okay. So what is our goal here? Our goal is to determine, oops, du by dx, du by dy, d square u by maybe dx dy, or for example, if it's not from probably maybe d square u by dx square, d square u by dy square. So d square u by dx dy. Right? I've not done a mixed derivative yet, even if for other cases, but we are probably I'm just going to like, uh, like, like let's say think about it and say maybe I have five terms that I write. If I can write these five terms then I know how to write my Navier-Stokes equation in an algebraic form, right? So what do I mean by algebraic form? We talked about partial differential equations where we had the derivatives. When I say algebraic form, we are writing in terms of addition and subtraction and multiplication, which is what we did for the Laplace. In the next class, we are going to take it and try to see how we can take our incompressible flow problem and try to write the 3D momentum equation in a more, uh, or at least uh, reduce it to a 2D form. 3D probably will probably be a little more is too much to write, but probably reduce it to 2D form and write our 2D Navier-Stokes equation using our finite difference. That's our next goal for the next class. But before we go there, we want to be able to write all different forms of it. And so that's the reason why we are trying to make do these derivations, right? So can you think about how to write these derivatives if delta x and delta y are changing? Okay. They're not constant. So initially, we assume they're constant throughout the mesh. Now we are saying they're not constant. They're continuously changing. They might be different at different points. At some point, they're small. At some point, they're less big. Then how do we write this thing? Okay, okay let, let me give you a couple of minutes to think about it. And then we will probably try to uh, finish up on that.
Okay, so I hope you guys give it a thought, any ideas of like how I can do that. Okay? Sir? Yeah? Values of delta x and delta y have to be separated into their own and their own. Okay. Okay, okay. But then there can be more than delta 1 and 2, right? So there can be a number of them. Yes. So we need to... Right, yeah. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay. Uh-huh. Okay, you seem to be going in the uh, right direction. That is nice, but how do I write it? For example, I have three different derivatives. If you remember, we had the forward difference, backward difference, and central difference. Right? So we said derivative at any point can be written in three different forms. Right? So we said there are three different ways of writing it. And we uh, did not say which is better than the other so far. We said we know three different ways of writing it so far. Our whole goal now is to write, take these three different forms and see how we can write it out. Given delta x and delta y are not uniform anymore, not the same throughout the grid anymore. Right? So let's fall back onto the most fundamental thing that we started out with. So where did we get these, all these expressions for du and du by dx, du by dy and so on? If you go back, we went, started out with the Taylor series expansion. So let's go back to the most fundamental thing where we started out with. Right? So I wrote, again going back to our Taylor series expansion, so we said ui plus 1 equal to ui plus delta x by, uh, yeah, uh, plus, yeah, sorry, plus delta x into do u by do x. Right? Is it right? Any ideas? Plus delta x square by 2 into dou square u by dou x square plus some higher order terms. Right? So that's what we said. So these are the derivatives at the point i. And then we kind of separated them out to get these derivatives. Right? So we did not say this delta x, we assumed it's the same. So now, is this delta x at the i or i plus 1? Right? Because we are saying ui plus 1 is ui plus some delta x. It was nice to write, but then we, because we never assumed that delta x is changing. But then at the ith point, the delta x can be different. i plus 1, the delta x can be different. At i, I minus 1, it can be different. What i, what is this delta x? Right? So we have not yet defined everything correctly when we started out with. We assume, we already made some assumptions. I made these assumptions without telling you. I said delta x, right? Before that I said the delta x is uniform, probably we assumed that delta x is uniform. We did not even think about it that delta x would be varying. It could be different now, right? So it, at each of these points it can be different. So what is the exact value that we should be using at this point? Any idea? Okay. So now, similarly, I, when I wrote my backward, I said i minus 1 is ui minus delta x into du by dx with i plus delta x square by 2 factorial into dou square u by dx square i plus higher order terms. I did the same thing here, same goof up. I did not define what delta x is. Where is this delta x? Because I assumed it's same everywhere. So probably if we are able to define this correctly now, we should be able to derive the du by dx and du by dy and all these quantities, even if delta x is varying, right? Going back to our 1D, so we started again with 1D here. If we know how to write the 1D, we know how to write the 2D. If we know how to write the 2D, then we are able to write the 3D, right? So essentially it's the same thing we are replicating. So I should probably define my delta x more accurately, right? If I can say this delta x is delta x at a point i or i plus 1 or i minus 1, then I might be able to say, okay, what should be the, it, even if the delta x is varying, even if the meshes have the non-uniform density, right? Okay, so let's try to rewrite this thing. Uh, 
So let's try to erase this and this. Okay, and clean this up. Square, this is square here, right? So I'm just going to write some things here. I'm going to define delta xi is equal to xi minus xi minus 1. And similarly here, this would be delta x of i plus 1, right? and this is delta x of i. Where? So for example, here, my delta x is nothing but x i plus 1 minus x i. Here, my delta x is nothing but x i minus x i minus 1. Okay. So I'm trying to somehow rewrite everything back in here again. I can rewrite it again here. i plus 1 divided by delta x i plus 1 u i i minus 1 i dx. So this is my forward difference. So my backward difference, right? Or I can add both of them and then can I write my central difference in a way? So how do I write my central difference here? Okay? So what we, so similarly we can write our du by dy as u of i. So if we extend it in 2D, let's, let's try to write it in 2D. So we can write du by dx at any i comma j as u of i plus 1 comma j comma j j. i minus i comma j minus minus 1 comma j. Okay. Similarly, I can also write in the y direction as du by dy i comma j Okay, right? I know there's a whole bunch of equations in there, but what we have tried to do today is try to set up a framework from where we can start to put all these derivatives that we have and put them into our Navier-Stokes equation. In the next class, what we are going to try to do is now we, we know how to write each of these derivatives, right? So we are going to go back to our equation of incompressible flow we have, we have taken various scenarios in the first class, right? So we said in the first class we talked about viscous flows, incompressible flows, compressible flows, and try to see how we can rewrite all these partial differential equations in a more discrete form. And second thing that we have not shown you yet is now you have these addition and subtractions and multiplications and division. We said we are going to write everything into a matrix equation. I have not yet shown how we can take this thing and write it into a matrix form. Right. So there are two things that are remaining that I have not shown you. First thing is how do we, we wrote all these derivatives. We took a very simple Laplace equation, tried to put it in there. But then we have not really solved any kind of a Navier-Stokes equation that you are interested in, like you know, flow or a car or something, right? or airfoil. So we'll try to take this thing and try to see how we can take these derivatives and put them into that form. Right. So just to recap what we have done today, we said that we have these partial differential equations that we want to solve. 
and we want to try to see if we can solve this flow or a problem, flow or some body, for example, an aircraft or an airfoil or, for example, a car. When you come into the lab tomorrow on, on Friday, for the rest of you who are, who are not in the lab today, you'll be starting with an airfoil, a 3D airfoil, and you'll be trying to see how we can simulate the flow over that. So you probably have a better idea now why we want to put a box in there. So for those who are in there today morning, you're wondering, okay, here's an airfoil, put a box around that. I said, you were like, okay, why should I put a box around that, right? So now we have a better idea of why we want to do that. So we said we can divide our flow problems into two things. One is either an external flow, which is happening over the body, or an internal flow, which is happening inside it. For example, if it's a flow inside a pipe, then we want to, you know, mesh inside the pipe. If we have a flow over a car, then we want to mesh around the car, right? First thing. So then second thing we said, okay, let's try to uh, make our mesh into a very simple check, like a chessboard, right? X, uh, even numbers along the x direction, even sizes along the y direction. Very simple and divide into equal squares. And we said, okay, if we know these equal squares, we know at each of these points, what are the values of our velocities. Then using that, we can find our derivatives. So once we know our derivatives, uh, we, we can solve our Navier-Stokes. So I've told you that we can solve our Navier-Stokes. So you've taken my, uh, you've trusted in me and said that, yes, probably this guy is saying something, so maybe we can solve it. We have not yet seen that, right? So, and then we, we wrote each of our derivatives, took this mesh, and we wrote each of our derivatives. So we said, okay, let's try to think of a simple thing in a 1D. So we started with a single line element, and we said that each of these lines, if I have, like, let's say, a point at which I'm getting the pressure and velocities, and I know, let's say, some certain number of points, can I write the derivative of each of these points, first thing. Uh, it seemed like it was reasonably easy. We used uh, what we call as a Taylor series expansion, and we wrote three different derivatives. We called it as forward, backward, and we also uh, and uh, so we have forward, back, backward, and central difference. Uh, let's say derivatives or schemes or whatever, right? So we're going to, as we go ahead, we'll try to define each of these things more rigorously. And then we said we still don't know which of this derivative is good to use, which is bad to use, but when we know that we can do it in three different ways. So that's what we are left out in two classes to find out which is good, which is bad, which should we use, which, should not, which we should not use. And then we said, okay, using this we can write our first derivative, we can write our second derivative. And similarly, we then extend it into 2D. We said if I know a point, i, comma, j, then the point on the right is maybe i plus 1, point on the left is i minus 1, up, up is j plus 1 and j minus 1. If I know these points, then I can know the derivative at this point. Initially, in 1D, we needed two points. Now we have four points, you know, to get the x and y derivatives. So now, once we are done with uh, that, we said, okay, we all, uh, so far we had assumed that the, the delta x and delta y are the same. And then we started out assuming that what if it's not the same, right? What if it's not the same? What if delta x and delta y are non-uniform? Right? So we have a non-uniform grid, can we solve with that? And then we have again go, gone back again to use our Taylor series expansion to rewrite our, all these forward and backward difference. And I've left out the central difference idea for you to think about. There are three questions we didn't answer. So what is this Laplace equation, right? When do we use this Laplace equation, right? Second thing that we have put up in on, I think, is if you go back here, how small should delta x be? So when I mean delta x, both delta x and delta y. So somebody put a word in there called convergence, mesh convergence. I don't know what mesh convergence is, so probably that's somehow related to delta x and delta y. And lastly, somehow to say that uh, what is, the, how do we find this using the central difference scheme. So we have three important questions that we have not answered that has been raised in the class today that we'll come back to in the next two classes and try to see if we can solve it. And hopefully by the end of the semester, the goal is that you'll be able to use these finite different techniques that we have learned today to be able to solve different types of flow problems, at least some genre of flow problems. Thank you so much and have a nice afternoon. Thank you. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Yeah. Sorry? Nope, 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 nope. So, so in the coursework, if you find the coursework from the last uh, uh, last year, probably that's been used for the last 10 years, I don't think that would be very useful for you. Because the coursework is completely changed, so I don't think you would, last 10 years, the uh, coursework lay completely on using fluent software. That will be completely different this year. It was a little bit different last year as well, but it will be a lot more different this year. So it will not be purely fluent focused. 
So it will also involve uh, assessment on uh, how much of finite difference you have understood and how you are able to implement it and use it for a flow problem.